Hi there and welcome back to our YouTube channel Code and Create. My name is George and I run this channel with my friend Lasha. In this video we're going to build a notes app using HTML, CSS and object-oriented JavaScript. Before we dive in, if you are interested in creating new projects and leveling up your skills, please smash the like button, subscribe to our channel and don't forget to ring the bell so you'll know whenever there is a new video out. We'd also love to hear from you so drop a comment below with any ideas or questions you have along the way. The notes app we are building today isn't just about creating a simple place to write down ideas. We're going to focus on structuring our code in a way that's both efficient and easy to expand. This means we'll be diving into some core programming concepts so you will not only end up with a functional app but also a deeper understanding of how to write clean and organized code. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. A notes app? Haven't we seen tons of tutorials on that already? And you're absolutely right. Building a notes app is one of those classic beginner projects that almost everyone tries at some point. But here is the catch. Most tutorials show a straightforward, procedural approach. Today we're going to switch things up and build the application using object-oriented programming with JavaScript to make it more dynamic and efficient. Let's take a look at the features and functionalities we'll be implementing in our notes app step by step. Our app will start with a main section where you can create a new note. You'll be able to enter a title and some text, then save it with the click of a button. The moment you add a note, it will instantly appear in the list of notes on the screen. This feature allows users to create multiple notes quickly and seamlessly. Each note we add will display not only the title and content, but also a timestamp showing when it was created. This way, users can see the date of each note, making it easier to keep track of when certain thoughts or tasks were added. The timestamp adds a layer of organization and context for each note. Our app will also allow users to edit their notes directly. We'll be using content editable fields so that users can click into a note, make changes to the title or content, and the app will automatically save those changes. This editing functionality means you don't need a separate edit mode or button. It is all quick and intuitive, just click and type. To keep things organized, we will add a delete feature. Each node will have a delete button that, when clicked, removes the node from the display and from our saved data. One of the most valuable features of this application is that it saves all nodes in local storage. This means that even if you close the app or refresh the page, your nodes will still be there the next time you open it. Local storage allows us to keep user data directly in the browser without needing a database making this a perfect feature for small projects like this. By the end, we'll have a fully functional, organized and stylish app. So let's get started. All right, so I've gone ahead and created a new folder on the desktop called Notes App, which right now is empty. I'm going to open it in VS Code. And then I'm going to create our working files. We need three files. The first one is going to be index.html. And then we will have here style.css and finally we need app.js. Besides that I'm going to create a folder called js in which I will store JavaScript modules and they will be created a bit later. Now I'm going to create basic HTML tags and for that I'm going to insert here an exclamation mark and then hit tab or enter. So here we go, we have here the basic HTML document. So here I'm going to change the title, it's going to be notes up. And then I'm going to link the CSS and JavaScript files. For that I'm going to open link tag. And then in the hreference attribute I'm going to specify the name of the file, it's going to be style.css. Next we need to link the JavaScript file and for that I'm going to open script tag. Then we need source attribute in which we have to specify the name of the file. It is app.js and besides that I'm going to add here an attribute called differ. So by adding differ we are telling the browser not to execute app.js file until the entire HTML document has been parsed. 
This is especially helpful because it ensures that our JavaScript will only run after all the HTML elements are loaded. So, without defer, the script might try to run before certain elements are available in the DOM and it could lead errors. Next, I'm going to add here another attribute which is type and we need here module. So, by setting type to module, we are telling the browser that this JavaScript file is a module. In JavaScript, modules allow us to organize our code into separate self-contained files, each handling a different part of the app. When we use modules, we can import and export functionality between files, making our code cleaner and more modular. Alright, so now I'm going to run the project to the browser using live server. For that, we can either click here, go live, or click open with live server. So, as you can see, our project is up and running in the browser. I'm going to place the editor and the browser side by side in order to make our working process more convenient. Let's place the editor on the left side. Okay, so throughout this tutorial, I'm going to use a library called Box Icons to add some stylish icons to our project. Box Icons is a free open source library of vector icons that are easy to integrate and customize. It offers a wide range of icons for different purposes, from simple UI elements like buttons and forms to more specific ones for things like social media and multimedia. Now, in order to integrate Box Icons library to our project, I'm going to search for Box Icons. So, this is the website of Box Icons library. Here you can find tons of different icons. I'm going to click Usage, and then we need to import the CSS, and I'm going to copy this CDN link from here. Let's paste it here in the head element. Alright, so the box icons library is integrated to our project and now we can start to create the HTML markup. Inside the body element, I'm going to open div tag, which is going to be notes up. It will be the wrapper of the entire content. Inside the div element, we need another div with the class name notes files. Then inside here, I'm going to create another div element with the class name new nodes. And then we need i elements. I mean the icon from the box icons library. I'm going to add here classes bx, bxs, file plus. If we check the browser, then you will find here the icon of the file. After that, I'm going to add here h3 heading element, and it's going to be at new node. Let's check again the browser. So, as you can see, we have here h3 heading element and the icon. Okay, so right now, that's it about the HTML markup. Now, I'm going to start to styling. Let's open style.css file, and here I'm going to create some defaults, I mean the common styles, let's select every element and first of all let's reset margin and padding, I mean the default margin and padding, I'm going to set both of them to zero and then we need to add here box sizing with the value border box. By default when we set dimensions like width and height on an element the browser calculates these sizes based only on the content and then it adds any padding and border outside of that. So if you set an element's width to let's say 200 pixels and then add 10 pixels of padding, the actual width ends up being 220 pixels. This can make things tricky to manage, especially as elements get more complex. So with box sizing border box we are changing that behavior now, the specified width and height include the padding and border as part of the total size of the element. So, if we set an element to 200 pixels wide, it stays exactly 200 pixels wide, regardless of the padding or border we add. 
Okay, after that, I'm going to add text decoration with the value none. Next, I'm going to add here phone family. And I'm going to add here a few different fonts. Let's insert Jill. Sans, then Jill. Sans, MT. Let's add here Calibri. Then I'm going to add Tributeit, or I don't know how to pronounce this word. Finally, we need font group, and it's going to be sans serif. Okay, so as you can see, all the styles are applied. Next, I'm going to select HTML elements, and I'm going to decrease the font size of the HTML elements to 62.5%. So by setting the font size on the HTML element to 62.5%, we are actually making it easier to work with font sizes in a more flexible way. Here is how it works. In most browsers, the default font size is 16 pixels. When we set the font size to 62.5%, we are effectively scaling it down to 10 pixels. This doesn't mean that all text will automatically be 10 pixels but rather it makes the math simpler. With this setup, we can now use RAM units to set font sizes and dimensions throughout our CSS. Since one RAM now equals 10 pixels, setting a font size to 1.6 RAM will give us 16 pixels, two RAM will give us 20 pixels, and so on. This way, we are able to work with clean decimal-based calculations rather than constantly figuring out percentages of 16. All right, so now we're going to set up some CSS variables to make our styling more efficient and flexible. Using CSS variables is incredibly effective, especially in projects with a lot of repeated styles. For example, if we want to change a color or adjust the width of the element later, we only have to update the variable in one place and it will automatically apply everywhere that variable is used. All right, so here I'm going to add roots in css roots is a pseudo class that represents the highest level of the document essentially it's the top level element of our css you can think of it like targeting the html element so by placing our css variables inside roots we are making them available throughout the entire document this means we can access these variables anywhere in our style sheet ensuring that our colors widths and other properties are consistent across all elements. So it is a great way to set up variables that will be used globally and it keeps our styling organized and easy to maintain. So here I'm going to add a couple of different variables. The first one is going to be width. We need here 30 RAM, which is equal to 300 pixels. Next we need border. I'm going to add here 0.1 RAM solid and the color is going to be white then i'm going to add here primary color and the color is going to be 2 2c 5 5e the next one is secondary color i'm going to add here color 555 which is a gray color and finally we need white color Let's add here three Fs. Okay, so after that, I'm going to customize the body elements. Let's select body and change the background color. I'm going to make the background color black. So as you can see, the background of the body element is now black and the elements are no longer visible. I'm going to add here color white in order to make the elements visible. Now you can see here the icon, which is file icon, and also the H3 heading element. I forgot to say that the sizes of the elements are now smaller, and it happens because we changed the font size of the HTML element, we decreased the font size of the root element. Alright, so after that I'm going to select notes up, which is the wrapper of the contents 
let's add here padding equal to 3 RAM on all four sides. Then I'm going to select node files. And inside here, I'm going to define the flex layout when you display flex. Then I'm going to place the items in the center vertically using align items center. Next, we need flex wrap. Wrap, it will allow to place the flex items on different lines. So we need here wrap. Next, we have gap equal to 3 RAM. And finally, I'm going to create some space at the bottom using margin bottom 3 RAM. Let's check the browser. Okay, so these tiles are applied. Next, we have to select new nodes. I'm going to define width and here I'm going to use the variable which we have defined, I mean the width. So in order to use the variable, I mean this value here, we need to use var function. And inside here we have to insert width. Next I'm going to use aspect ratio. Let's make it 1. So in this case the width and height of the element will be always equal. Okay, after that, I'm going to define the border. Let's add here 0.2 RAM, dashed, and the color is going to be white. So we need again var function. And here I'm going to insert white color. Let's go to the browser. So as you can see, the border is displayed on the page. Next, I'm going to make the border rounded. For that, we have to use border radius with the value 50%. Next, we have, again, flex layout, so we need to display flex. I'm going to change the direction of the flex layout. Let's use flex direction with the value column. So in this case, the flex items will be placed vertically in a column. Next, we need to center the content using a line items center and then justify content center. Also, I'm going to define row gap. Let's make it one RAM. And finally, change the cursor, make it pointer. Okay, so now we have here a circle, and also the cursor is changed. We have now the pointer. After that, I'm going to customize the icon. So let's go ahead and select new node, followed by the eye elements. I'm going to change the color. Let's use again the CSS variable. We need warp function. And in this case, I'm going to use primary color, which is a green color. Next, we need font size. Let's make it 8 RAM. I mean 80 pixels. Okay, so now as you can see, the icon looks pretty nice. Now I'm going to customize the heading. I mean H3 heading element. So let's go ahead and select notes, actually new notes. Followed by the H3 heading elements. We need here font size, 2 RAM. Then I'm going to change the font weight. Let's make it lighter, 300. I'm going to transform text to capitalize. All right, so that's it. The new nodes is customized. And now we have to add some more content to our HTML. Right after heading, I'm going to add here form with the class name, node form. We don't need action attributes, so let's get rid of it. Next, we need here input elements with type text. I'm going to add here placeholder with the value node title. And also we need here class name, it's going to be title input. After that, I'm going to create text area. And inside here, we need placeholder with the value notes. Then I'm going to add here class name. Let's add here notes, text, input. After the text area, I'm going to create button. Let's add here class 
notes btn and also let's add here text add all right so i think that's it about the form let's go to the browser so here we have the newly created html elements and now it's time to customize those elements as well so let's open style.css file and here i'm going to select node form let's define the position it's going to be absolute then we need position relative for the parent element which is new node so i'm going to add here position relative after that let's define flex layout so we need to display flex then we have to change the flex direction let's make it column and finally we need row gap with value one ram all right so as you can see the inputs and the button are aligned nicely next we have to customize those two inputs i mean input element and the text area so let's go ahead and select both of them we need title input and then i'm going to select notes text input first of all let's define width it's going to be 22 ram then i'm going to change the background color in this case i'm going to use primary color i mean this green color here next we need padding let's make it 0.5 ram at the top and bottom and then one ram on the left and right sides also we need border let's use again the variable border next we need border radius i'm going to make it 0.3 ram also i'm going to remove default outline let's make it none then we have font size and it's going to be 1.8 ram also change the color let's use here variable white color and finally i'm going to disable the resizing function of the text area element so we have to set resize to none okay let's go to the browser so as you can see the input element and the text area look nice but we have to add some more styles to those elements let's select text area we need note text input and change the height in case of the text area we need height to be 7 rep all right now i'm going to customize the placeholders so we need to grab those two selectors let's add them here and then we need to add placeholder pseudo element i'm going to change the color of the text let's use variable white color So as you can see, the color of the placeholder attributes are changed. All right. So after that, I'm going to customize the button. Let's go ahead and select note btn. I'm going to set width to max content. So this property is a CSS feature that sets the width of an element based on its content. Essentially, it tells the browser to size the element just large enough to fit all its contents without wrapping. So, if you have a button with text inside, setting width to max content will make the button only as wide as the text inside it. So, it is a great way to avoid extra empty space or unnecessary stretching. After that, I'm going to add other styles as well. Let's set background color to RGBA. We need here a white color, 255 three times, and the opacity 0.741. Then I'm going to set position to absolute. We're going to position the button at the bottom right corner of the input. So I'm going to add here bottom 0 and right 0. Then we need padding. 0.4 RAM at the 
top and bottom sides and 0.6 RAM on the left and right sides. Next we have color, which is going to be 3, 3, 3, and actually that's it. Let's go to the browser. So as you can see, we have here button. I'm going to get rid of default border. Let's set it to none. All right, so the last thing regarding button is to create some hover effects. So I'm going to select node BTN with hover. I'm going to change the background color. Let's make it white. And then we need transition for smoother effect. Let's add here background color. And the duration of the transition is going to be 0.3 seconds. Okay, so after that, I'm going to go back to the index.html file and create HTML markup for nodes. I mean, this part here. So let's add right after this closing div tag another div with the class name. It's going to be nodes. Inside here, we need HT heading element with the class title. Actually, we need here title. The content is going to be notes title. Besides that, I'm going to add here attribute called contents editable, and I'm going to make it true. So the content editable attribute is a handy HTML feature that makes an element directly editable by the user. When you add this attribute to an HTML element, it essentially turns that element into a text editor. This means users can click on the element, type in new text, or make changes to the existing text directly on the page. In our notes app, we use content editable attribute with the value true to allow users to edit the title and the content of their notes without needing a separate edit mode or input field. It creates a smooth, user-friendly experience where users can simply click on the text they want to change or make the edit. All right, so after that, after the h2 heading element, I'm going to create a paragraph with the class name notes text. And inside here, I'm going to add notes text. Like the heading elements, I'm going to add here content editable with the value true as well. Then after paragraph, I'm going to create div elements with the class name settings. And inside here, we need span elements with the class dates. Right now, I'm going to insert here some hard-coded date. Let's say 06, 11, 20, 24. Then we need link elements with the class name delete button. I mean btn and here I'm going to insert i elements with the classes bx bxs trash now if we go to the browser you'll find here all the elements and now it's time to customize those elements so let's go ahead and open style.css file and here I'm going to add notes First of all, as defined within height, the width is going to be variable width. Then we need height with the same size. Let's add here width. We could use here aspect ratio, but I'm going to keep here height with the same value. Next, I'm going to change the background color. In this case, let's use color 1C1. 917 actually we need here c is then we need border let's use again variable border after that i'm going to set up flex layout so we need display flex then i'm going to change the direction it's going to be flex direction column next we need justify content space between in order to create some space between the flex items and also, I'm going to align items in the center. 
let's check the results so as you can see all the styles are applied to the elements next i'm going to define padding it's going to be 0.5 ram at the top and bottom sides and one ram on the left and right sides and also we need to make the corners of the element rounded using border radius with the value one ram okay so that's it about the notes next i'm going to customize the title and the text i'm in the heading and the paragraph let's select both elements simultaneously we need here notes text let's set with to 100 percent then we have background color and it's going to be secondary color also i'm going to set border radius to one ram Actually, we need border radius. It's going to be one RAM. Then we will have here letter spacing to create some space between the letters. Let's set it to point one RAM. Then I'm going to set padding to 1.5 RAM at the top and bottom sides and one RAM on the left and right sides. And finally, I'm going to define outline, which is going to be point one RAM solid and the color is going to be black all right so as you can see the heading and the paragraph are customized but we have to add to those elements some more styles let's select them separately i'm going to select title let's add here height which is going to be 30 percent then we need background color and actually we no longer need background color Let's get rid of it. We need font size, which is going to be 2.5 RAM. And then I'm going to set font weights to 300. And finally, we need text align center. Okay, so that's it about the title. Let's check the results. As you can see, the title looks pretty nice. Next, we have paragraph. So let's go ahead and select node text. Let's set height to 50% and then we need font size to be 2 RAM. Alright, so that's it about the paragraph. Next we have settings. I mean this element here, which includes span, I mean the date and also the delete button. So let's go ahead and select settings. Let's set width to 100%, then we need display, flex, followed by justify content, space between, which creates some space between the flex items, and then we need align item center. Let's check the result. So, as you can see, the layout of those elements is changed. Next, I'm going to select span elements, which has the class name date. Let's set font size to 1.6 RAM. And then I'm going to select delete button followed by the eye elements. I mean the icon. Let's set font size to 2 RAM. All right, so both elements are customized. Next, I'm going to customize paragraph and heading on focus. I mean, once we focus those elements we have to change the outline so let's go ahead and select title with focus and then we need no text with again focus actually i'm going to move this code up So on focus, we're going to change outline and it's going to be 0.1 RAM solid and the color will be primary color, which is a green color. We need transition with outline and the duration is going to be 0.2 seconds. All right, so as you can see, we have here nice and cool focus effect all right so after that i'm going to take care of the customization of the edit mode and we're going to create this edit mode using before pseudo element 
So I'm going to select title with before student element and then note text with again before pseudo element. First of all, I'm going to define the content and it's going to be edit mode. Next, we'll have position with absolute. I'm going to set position relative for the parent elements. So we need to hit position relative. Next, I'm going to define top and right properties. Let's set both of them to zero. Then we need font size. It's going to be 1.2 RAM. Also, we need border radius. So in this case, border radius will be zero at the top left corner, then zero at the top right corner, zero at the bottom right corner, and 0.4 RAM at the bottom left corner. Next, we need padding. Let's make it 0.1 RAM at the top and bottom sides, and 0.5 RAM on the left and right sides. Change background color, use here primary color. All right, so let's go to the browser. So as you can see, we have here nice and cool edit mode elements. I'm going to hide those elements. So for that, let's use opacity zero and visibility hidden. We have to display them once we focus the elements. So I'm going to grab those selectors then i'm going to add here before see the elements and we need to display back the elements so let's grab those two properties paste them here and change the values we need opacity one and visibility visible also let's add here position with all point to second let's go to the browser so as you can see once we focus the elements then the edit mode will be activated all right after that i'm going to take care of the scroll bars i mean we have to create the custom scroll bars like we have it in the finished version for that first of all i'm going to copy this text and paste here so as you can see the layout is messed up so let's go ahead and select actually we don't need to select because we have already selected those elements so let's add here overflow y auto and then we have to select title followed by WebKit scroll bar. Next, we need here the same for the paragraph as well. So let's add here no text. I'm going to set width to 0.4 RAM. Then we need background color to be, let's say, 888, which is light gray color and now i'm going to set border radius to 0.5 ram so as you can see the scroll bar is created and we are able to scroll the text next we have to create thumb so i'm going to grab these selectors and then i'm going to add here thumb Let's define background color and use primary color. And also we need border radius to be 0.5 RAM. Let's go to the browser. So as you can see, we have here nice and cool thumb, actually the scroll bar. So we have here a tiny issue. As you can see, the parts, I mean the top and bottom parts of the scroll bar are placed outside of the elements. 
So we have to fix that problem. And for that, I'm going to use one of the CSS properties called clip path. So let's add here clip path. We need inset. And inside here, I'm going to insert zero round and one wrap. Let's check the results and then I will explain how this property works. So now the problem is fixed. All right. So the clip path property in CSS is used to define a visible area for an element, essentially clipping away parts outside of this defined shape. In this case, we're using clip path to create a rounded rectangle clipping area. The inset function with the value zero means we are setting the clipping area to start from the very edges of the element without any inset margins. The round one ram part applies rounded corners with a one ram radius, giving our element a rounded border effect. So that's the way how clip path property works. Now I'm going to hide the form. So let's find node form. And add here opacity zero and visibility hidden. Let's check the browser. So the form is hidden. Next, I'm going to comment this part out as well. So let's go to the index.html file and comment notes, make it invisible as well. All right. Now that our HTML and CSS are set up, it's time to move into the JavaScript part. To keep our code organized and maintainable, we're going to use modules. In general, modules allow us to break down our code into smaller, focused pieces, each handling a specific part of our app. This way, our code will be easier to understand, expand and also debug. So first we have our main app.js file which acts as the entry point for our application. This file will initialize the app and bring all the other modules together. Think of it as the control center that coordinates different parts of the application. For now it is empty, but we will come back to it to connect everything later. Let's start by creating a new module called controller, which will be placed here in the JS file, I mean folder. So let's create here controller JS. This file will act as the main controller of our app, handling interactions between the user interface and the data. In other words, the controller will be responsible for managing how the app behaves when we create, edit or delete nodes. It is the module that controls the core functionality of our app hence the name controller. Next, we need to create another module and it's going to be UI controller. So this module will focus on managing all the UI related tasks like rendering elements on the screen and handling user interface updates. By separating UI logic into its own module, we keep the visual side of the app separate from the data and control logic, making it easier to adjust the layout or styling without affecting the core functions. Next, I'm going to create another module and it's going to be app controller. Yes. So this file will define a blueprint or structure for each node we create. Here we will use a class to create node objects that hold properties like title, date, content, and so on. Having a dedicated app controller module helps us organize our data as objects, making it easy to work with multiple nodes, update them, and save them consistently. All right, after that, we have to connect those modules and initialize our application. For that, we need to create JavaScript classes. So in JavaScript, classes are a blueprint for creating objects with specific properties and methods. They provide a way to organize and structure code in an object-oriented style, making it easier to work with complex applications. So by using classes, we can create multiple objects or instances. 
that follow the same structure but hold different data. This approach makes our code modular, reusable, and easier to maintain as our project grows. Okay, so now it's time to create classes in our newly created modules. So I'm going to start with app controller. Let's create here class app controller. Then we need export default app controller. After that, I'm going to open UI controller. And here I'm going to create class UI controller. Again, we need export default UI controller. Next, I'm going to open controller. First of all, I'm going to import classes from app controller and UI controller. So we need here import app controller. Actually, we need app controller from app controller.js. Let's duplicate this line of code and change the name of the module. We need UI controller. Okay, after that, we have to create new class and it's going to be controller. We need again export default controller. All right, finally, I'm going to open up the JS file and import controller from controller.js. Now that we have our module set up and connected, the next step is to actually initialize our application. We will do this by creating a new instance of the controller class right in our app.js file. In order to do that, we need new controller. So what does this mean and why do we need it? By creating an instance of controller, we are essentially saying something like, let's start the application. This instance acts as the main engine that powers the entire application. When we create it, we are allowing controller to connect with app controller and UI controller modules, so it can manage both the data and the user interface. In other words, this single line of code is what brings everything to life. Now that we have set up our modules, it's time to add some interactivity to our application. The first feature we will implement is opening the form when we click on the Add New Node button. I mean, once we click Add New Node button, we should open the form. So to start, we need to access the Add New Node button in our UI controller so that we can control it directly. In UI controller.js module, we're going to set up a property that targets this button. This is as simple as selecting the new node element with document query selector method. Before we select new node element, we need to set up something called a constructor function in our UI controller class. So here inside the curly braces, we need constructor. It is a method. Now, if you're new to JavaScript classes, a constructor function might sound a bit technical, but it's actually quite simple and very useful. The constructor function is a special method in JavaScript class that automatically runs when we create an instance of the class. In our case, we will use the constructor to grab key elements from our HTML, like the add new node button, and store them as properties of the UI controller. This way, whenever we need to interact with these elements, we can just refer to them easily through UI controller. Okay, so now we have to select a new node element, and for that, we need to add here this dot new node. Actually, in JavaScript, this is a special keyword that refers to the current instance of the class. So whenever we use this inside our class, we are pointing to the specific object created from the class. All right, so as I said, we have to select this element. So we need here document not query selector. And we have to specify the class name. It is new node. Now, Let's go to the controller module and create here again a constructor method. 
Next, we need to create a method that will allow us to open the form once we click the new node button. So down below, I'm going to create a method. Let's call it open form. All right, now that we have our new form method in the controller, the next step is to extract the add new node element from the UI controller so we can interact with it. This will allow us to handle user interactions with the button directly within the controller class. First, we need to create an instance of UI controller within the controller. So inside the constructor function, we have to add this.UI controller equal to new UI controller. What this does is it gives controller direct access to all the elements and methods defined in the UI controller. Think of it like a bridge that connects controller to everything UI related. So now, anytime we want to work with UI elements, we can refer to this .UI controller, which keeps things clean and makes sure that UI related code stays within the UI controller. Now that we have UI controller accessible within controller, we can go ahead and extract the specific element we need, the add new node button. To do this, we use the structuring, which lets us pull the new node element directly from the UI controller. So inside the open form function, we can add variable and then use the structuring. So we need new nodes from this dot UI controller. What this line does is it creates a variable named new node that holds the reference to the add new node element we targeted in the UI controller. Now that we've set up access to the add new node button, the next step is to make it functional. In order to do that, I'm going to create new function inside the open form method. And this function is going to be open form fn. We need here an arrow function. And inside here, I'm going to insert event object. So inside the function, the first line is going to be e.prevent default. So what this line does is that it prevents the default behavior of the button, which could be a form submission or other action that might interrupt our code. By preventing the default, we are making sure that clicking the button only triggers our custom functionality without any unwanted side effects. Next, we want to make the form visible, and in order to achieve that, we will add a class named active to our new node element. So inside here, we need new nodes dot class list. It is a property which includes all the classes the element has. And now we need add method. And here we have to specify the name of the class. As I said, it's going to be active. So adding the class active will change the styling of the form, making it visible to the user. We will set up the active class in our CSS with styles that make the form appear by adjusting properties like opacity and also visibility. Now that we have the open form function ready, we need to connect it to our button so that it runs when the button is clicked. For that, we need to add here new nodes dots add event listener. Then we have to specify the type of the event, which is going to be click. And here we have to pass open form fn. So this event listener will listen for a click event on the button and when that event occurs, it will execute the open form fn function. Next, we need to make sure that the open form method runs when the app initializes. And in order to do that, we have to call this method inside the constructor function. So here we need this dot open form with the parentheses. So by calling this method, we are setting up everything we need to manage the form opening process from the moment the app starts. To complete our form opening functionality, we need to add a bit of CSS to control the form's visibility. So we'll be using the active class that we applied in our JavaScript. Let's go to the style.css file. And here, after node form, we have to select active. 
followed by node form. Actually, we need here node form. And here we need opacity with the value 1 and then visibility visible. Okay, so here is how this works. In our JavaScript, we added the active class to the form when the user clicks the add new node button. This line of CSS targets any node form element that's inside an element with the active class. By setting opacity to 1 and visibility to visible, we're making the form fully visible on the screen. Now let's go to the browser and test if it works. Let's click add new node. As you can see, it doesn't work. So we might have a mistake. Let's go to the controller. So we have here open form a fan. Actually, this line of code should be outside of this function. That might be the reason. Now, if I click, then the form will be open. All right, so as you can see, everything works perfectly. Now that we've set up the form to open when we click the add new node button, we need to manage closing the form once we click outside of the new node button. So to achieve this, we will add an event listener to the window object. This allows us to listen for any click that happens anywhere on the screen. Our code will check where the click happened. If the click occurred outside the add new node button, then we will remove the active class, effectively hiding the form. So let's go back to the VS Code and inside here select window followed by the event listener. We need to add here a click. And then we need an arrow function with event objects. So inside the event listener we need to add the following code. I'm going to add not e dot target dot closest and here we need to select the elements new nodes. So here e dot target represents the element that was clicked and closest function checks if that element or any of its ancestors has the class new node. If it finds the element with that class it means that the user clicked inside the add new node area. However, we have added here a node operator before the code. This means we are specifically looking for clicks that didn't happen inside the add new node area. When this expression is true, it means the click was outside the element, so we proceed to remove the active class from new node. This will hide the form by reversing the style changes we applied when opening it. Now we need to add here an operator followed by new nodes dot class list dot remove class active. Let's go to the browser, open the form, then click outside of the add new node area. As you can see, the form is closing once we click outside of the element. All right, so everything works perfectly so far. Next, we're going to add a small but important enhancement to our form opening functionality. So far, our form opens when the user left clicks on the add new node button. However, some users might right click on the button instead, expecting it to behave the same way. To make our app feel responsive and intuitive, we're going to handle right clicks as well. So the form opens consistently whether users left click or right click. In order to do that, I'm going to duplicate this line of code and instead of click event, I'm going to insert context menu. So by adding an event listener for the context menu event on new node, we are telling the application to run the open form fn function whenever the user right clicks on the add new node button. So now if we go to the browser and right click, then the form will be opened. All right, now that we have the basics in place, it's time to add functionality for creating a new node. We want users to be able to fill in the form, 
click the add button and see their new node instantly appear on the screen. In order to achieve that, first of all, we need to select a couple of different necessary elements in the UI controller. So let's open this module. And here I'm going to select a couple of different elements. The first one is actually let's duplicate this line of code. So the first one is node files. I'm going to change the name. We need node files and then we have to change the class name. We need nodes files. The next one is node form. Let's change the class name. Then duplicate again this line of code. Next we have node title. The class name is going to be node. Actually not node, but we need here title input. Then I'm going to select node text. The class name is going to be notes text input. It is the text area element. And finally, I'm going to select notes btn. The class name is going to be node btn. All right, so by setting up these properties in the constructor function, we ensure that UI controller has access to all the elements it needs for node management. This step is essential because it allows us to reference these elements easily from within the controller, keeping our code organized and making it straightforward to interact with each part of the node creation form. So, now we have to move to appcontroller.js file. As you can see, the class is empty right now. And here we have to define the structure of a node. For this, we'll create a constructor function that will set up each new node object. So here I'm going to add constructor. This constructor will take three parameters. The first one is going to be title. Then we will have nodes and time. Inside here, we have to set up properties for each node instance we create. So I'm going to add here this dot title equal to title. And then we'll have this dot nodes equal to nodes. And finally, this dot time equal to time. So again, we define unique properties for each node object. This approach ensures that each node instance has its own specific title, content, and timestamp. It makes it easy to manage and display nodes individually. When we call this constructor, it will initialize a new node object with these properties. Next, let's go ahead and move to controller.js file and set up a method called create node data. So, right after open form method, I'm going to create create nodes data method. So, this method will handle the overall process of creating a new node from capturing the user input to rendering the node on the screen. By creating a dedicated method for this, we are keeping the functionality clean and encapsulated which makes it easier to manage and update later if we need to add more steps or features. Inside this method, we will extract the elements we already set up in the UI controller. I mean, those elements here. We're going to extract all of these elements inside the create node data method. So we need here new nodes, then node files. Next, we have node title. And then the next one is node text and node button. We should extract those variables from this dot UI controller. So this structure ensures that the controller has access to everything it needs to create and display a new node. Now that we have access to these elements, we can set up an event listener on node btn which is the 
button that triggers node creation. The event listener will listen for a click on node button and when it detects one, it will execute our code to create a new node. So inside here, I'm going to add event listener to node btn. The event type is going to be click and then we need an arrow function, a callback function, which will be executed once we click node button. So here I'm going to add event object. Inside the event listener, we have to start by creating two methods. I'm going to add here e dot prevent default. We have used this method already. And also we need e dot stop propagation. So as you know, the first one is for preventing any default form submission behavior. And the second one is for stopping the event from bubbling up. This ensures that clicking the button only triggers our custom node creation code without any unintended side effects. Now, we are at the point where we are ready to create a new node. To do this, we need to capture both the current date and the information the user has entered into the form. This step is essential for building each node with a title, content, and also with a timestamp. First, I'm going to create current date. It should be equal to new date object, followed by two local date string. And here we have to specify engp. So here we are creating a variable called current date to hold the current date. We use new date to get the current date and time, but because we only need the date in a readable format, we call to local date string to format it in the day, month, year style, which is more user friendly. The ENGB parameter specifically formats it in British date style, like day, month, and year. Next, I'm going to create a new instance of app controller, I mean a new node instance. So, right after this line of code, I'm going to create new variable nodes, which should be equal to new app controller. I'm going to insert here three arguments. The first one is going to be node title dot value. Then we need notes text again with value. And finally, we need timestamp. I'm in the current date variable that we just created. So I'm going to insert here current date. So again, we are creating here a new instance of app controller, which actually is a note model. Here, note title dot value and note text dot value are capturing the title and content that the user entered in the form. We pass these values along with current date into the app controller constructor. The constructor then assigns these values to the properties of the new node instance by creating a new instance of app controller with these specific values. We are encapsulating all the information we need for each node in one structured object. So this makes it easy to manage each node as a single unit with its own title, content and date. Next, I'm going to create an empty array where we will store new nodes we create. So here I'm going to create this dot new nodes and I'm going to make it equal to an empty array. After that, we need to add created nodes to that array. So here I'm going to add this dot new notes dot push and I'm going to insert here note. All right, so I'm going to test how all of these things work. I'm going to run to the console this dot new notes, the array itself, and then I'm going to add here note. Now, in order to run this code, we need to call create note data method here inside the constructor. Now, let's go to the browser. I'm going to inspect the page and open console tab, then open form and enter here. Let's say title 
then I'm going to insert here some text, click add button. So here we go. We have here newly created node, which consists of three properties. We have content, I mean notes, some text, then time, and also the title of the note. On the left side, we have the array itself. I'm going to add here other notes. Let's add. So, as you can see, now we have two nodes in the array and each of them with the proper properties and values. All right, so everything works perfectly. Now that our data is ready, let's move back to UI controller to define the create node HTML method. Let's open this module. So create node HTML method will handle the display of the nodes on the screen. I'm going to create new method, create node HTML. And I'm going to insert here two parameters. The first one is going to be node data. And the second one will be nodes, files, elements. So the create node HTML method takes two parameters, node data and node files element. Node data represents the new node which is created. As for the second parameter, node files element is the container where all the nodes are displayed. By passing node data and node files element as parameters, we make this function flexible and also reusable allowing it to render any node in any container we specify. Inside this function, I'm going to define the HTML structure for a new node. As you remember, we created a node element in our index.html file. I mean this HTML element here. So right now it is paused. I'm going to grab this entire code. Then I'm going to create here a new variable. Let's call it notes HTML. Then I'm going to open template literals and paste here the copied code. Now I'm going to make the data dynamic. Right now we have here some hard coded data. I mean, no title, no text, and also the hard coded date. So instead of note title, we need here dollar sign with curly braces. And I'm going to insert notes data dot title let's copy this code then instead of node text i'm going to insert here node data dot notes which is the contents of the node and finally we need notes data time so again instead of hard-coded data we used here the dynamic one Let's go through where this data comes from. Node data is an object that holds the information for a particular node and it is passed as a parameter to the create node HTML function. When we created a new node instance earlier in the app controller module, we set up properties like title, node and time. So node data dot title pulls in the title text that the user entered. Then note data note represents the main content of the note and note data time is the timestamp we captured when the note was created. So by referencing these properties within the HTML template, we are dynamically inserting the data from each node instance. Now that we've created the HTML structure for our node, the next step is to actually display it on the screen. To do this, we will use a method called insert adjacent html this will allow us to insert our newly created node into the main nodes container so that it becomes visible to the user right after here i'm going to insert node files element dot insert adjacent html and i'm going to insert here before and and then we need nodes HTML. Now let's break down how this line of code works. As I said, node files element is the container where all nodes are displayed. We are calling the insert adjacent HTML method on this container to add a node HTML variable as a new node inside it. 
the first argument before n actually we are missing here one e so the first argument before and specifies the position where we want to insert the html element i mean the node html concept so before and means that we are inserting node html before the closing tag of node files element which places the new node at the end of the existing list of nodes this way every time a new node is added it appears at the bottom of the node container keeping the list organized and in the order nodes are created the second argument known html is the html structure we created for each node i mean this variable here and it includes the node title node text and the date by passing node html as the content to insert we are effectively adding that html structure into the dom making it appear on the screen as a fully rendered node now in order to make this function work we have to call it in the controller module so let's go to the controller.js file before we call this function first we need to extract it from the ui controller for that we have to insert here create notes html and then we have to call this function let's get rid of this line of code so we need to create node html and we have to pass here two arguments the first one is going to be notes as for the second one we need here node files all right let's go to the browser i'm going to enter the title and the text click add and here we go we have here the notes displayed on the screen and now if i check the elements tab in the node files element we will find new notes as you can see as the content of the title is title and as the content of the paragraph we have here some text the values that we entered in the input fields all right so everything works perfectly and now that we've got our node creation process working it's time to add a small but important feature clearing the form after the node is submitted right now when we add a new node the form remains open with the previous input still visible and i think it's not ideal for user experience so let's go ahead and make sure the form closes and the input fields reset after a node is submitted let's go back to the vs code and right after here i'm going to add new nodes dot class list dot remove class active this line removes class active from the form container effectively hiding the form remember the active class is what makes the form visible so by removing it we are telling the browser to hide the form once the node is submitted this way the form closes as soon as the user clicks the submit button keeping the interface clean next we have to reset the input fields for that we need node title dot value equal to an empty string and in the same way we need node text dot value equal to an empty string let's go to the browser and add new node if i click add then the form will be closed and we'll have here the node on the screen okay so everything works fine now to make our app more intuitive let's add a feature that allows users to create a new node by pressing the enter key right now the only way to add a node is by clicking the add button here so to implement this we will add an event listener to the notes text field which is where the user types the content of the node this event listener will listen for a key down event which is triggered whenever the user presses a key while focused on the notes text field so let's go back to the vs code and here i'm going to add node text 
dots at event listener the event is going to be key down then we need a callback function with an event object now we have to add here an if statement where we have to check if the key is enter or not so we need if e dot key is equal to enter if it is true then we have to run node btn dot click so this triggers the same function that runs when the user manually clicks the button allowing the nodes to be created and added to the list now let's go to the browser and enter here the title also the text now if i hit enter then the note will be added and displayed on the screen all right so next we're going to add a small but important check to improve the quality of our notes right now if we submit the form with empty fields we are able to create blank notes i mean if we open the form and click add then the empty note will be added actually we don't need that so to fix this we're going to add a condition that checks if both the title and content fields have actual text before allowing a new note to be created this will prevent the creation of empty notes and ensure that each note added to the list has meaningful content so let's go back to the vs code and right after current dates i'm going to create if statements in which i'm going to insert the following condition we need note title dot value dot trim not equals then we need empty string then it should be followed by an operator and note text dot value dot trim not equals to an empty string now i'm going to insert this code inside the if statement so we added here a condition which checks if both the title and content fields are empty or not here is how it works first we check if note title dot value does not equal to an empty string note title dot value retrieves the current input from the title field and trim method removes any extra white space from both sides of the input by trimming the white space we make sure that even if the user has entered only spaces it won't count as valid input then we check that this trimmed value isn't an empty string ensuring that the title field actually contains meaningful text now the second part does the same but for note text i mean the content of the note now let's go to the browser click add and as you can see the note is no longer added on the screen now i'm going to enter title and then try again to add the note as you can see it's not added let's remove title and add text in the contents field click add so it's not added all right so everything works perfectly now that we have our node creation process in place the next step is to add the ability to delete notes this feature will allow users to remove notes they no longer need making the app more functional and giving users control over their content so let's go through the modification step by step and i will explain each part in detail as we go first we need to set up a way to select all the notes and all the delete buttons in the ui so in the ui controller let's open ui controller we're going to create two properties the first one will be a function that selects all elements with the class node and stores them in an array so here i'm going to add this dot notes which should be equal to an arrow function and i'm going to return here an array with spread operator and here we have to select all nodes using document dot query select to all method as the class name i'm going to insert notes 
Okay, so when this function is called, it returns an array of all elements on the page with the class node. This function is used to dynamically select all nodes currently present in the DOM. With query selector all method, we create a node list. And to convert this node list into a true array, we wrap it in square brackets and use the spread operator. This spread operator takes each item in the node list and spreads it into a new array. Now, in the same way, we have to select all delete buttons. So I'm going to add here this dot delete btns equal to an arrow function. And again, we need an array with spread operator and we have to select. Actually, we need query selector all method. We have to select all delete buttons. All right, so with these selections in place, let's move to controller.js file. And now we have to create a new method for deleting the nodes. Down below, after create node data, I'm going to create new method. It's going to be delete nodes. So again, this method, actually we need here delete nodes. So this method will handle the process of removing nodes from both the UI and also the array. And inside delete node, the first thing that we need to do is to define three different variables. The first variable is going to be nodes. And we have to add here this dot UI controller dot nodes. As you remember, it is a function that we have just created in the UI controller. Next, in the same way, we need to create second variable for delete btns and we have to grab these btns from ui controller dot delete btns function actually it is a function so like notes we set delete btns called the function we created in the ui controller actually we need here delete btns so something's wrong here let's check ui controller we need delete btns okay now everything's okay now the third variable is going to be node files so we need here node files from this dot ui controller as you remember, node files is the container element where all nodes are stored and which we will need in order to remove a node from the DOM. Next, we have to loop through the delete buttons array using forage method. So here we need delete btns, not forage. Inside here, I'm going to insert a callback function with two parameters, btn and i, which is the index number. So, so inside this loop, we will attach a click event handler to delete button individually. For each button, we have to define an onClick function, which will be executed when the button is clicked. So inside here, we need btn.onClick. It should be equal to an arrow function. Inside the function, we'll first remove the corresponding node element from the DOM. So in order to do that, we need node files dot remove child. And here we need to insert nodes. And then as the index number, we have to insert I. So here nodes with the index number I targets the specific node associated with the clicked delete button. By removing it from node files, we are ensuring that the node disappears visually from the application. After removing the node from the UI, we also need to update the data by removing the node from the new nodes array. This array holds all the nodes instances that we have created. So to keep it in sync with the UI, we remove the nodes at the same index i. So right after here, we need this dot new nodes followed by this splice method. And here we have to insert two arguments. The first one is i, as for the second one, it is one. 
So the splice method is a powerful JavaScript function that allows us to modify an array by adding, removing or replacing the elements. It takes two main arguments, the starting index and the number of items to remove. There is also an optional third argument if you want to add elements to the array at that specific position. So in our case, the first argument is i, which represents the index of the item we want to remove from new nodes. This i value is the index of the specific node we are targeting. The second argument, which in our case is 1, specifies the number of items to remove from the array starting at index i. By setting this to 1, we are telling JavaScript to remove exactly one item from new nodes at the specified position. To activate this delete functionality, we need to call delete node in two places. First, we call it in the constructor, ensuring that the delete functionality is applied to any nodes that might already be present when the application loads. So we have to call delete node here. And besides that, we have to call it in the create node data. I mean here. We need this dot delete node. So we need to call this function here because every time a new node is created, we reapply the delete functionality to include the new nodes delete button. Okay, let's go to the browser and check if it works. I'm going to add new nodes. Then click delete button. I'm going to open console. So we don't have any errors here. Let's go back to the VS code and check the function. So I think everything is correct. Let's check for each. Well, we need here on click with lowercase. Let's go to the browser. Now create new notes. Click delete button. So as you can see, we got here type error failed to execute. Remove child on node. Parameter one is not of type node. So here everything seems to be correct. Let's go to the UI controller. Actually, we are missing here dots. It is a class name. Now let's check if it works. Add new nodes. Click and yes, everything works perfect. We had some little mistakes in the code. Now that we have the ability to create and delete nodes, let's add the option to edit them as well. To achieve this, we'll create a new method called edit node which will handle the editing functionality. So let's go back to the VS Code and in the controller module, right after delete node method, create new method. It's going to be edit node. So this method will be responsible for setting up event listeners on each node's title and content, so users can modify them. Now we have to define a variable called nodes, which should be equal to this dot UI controller dot nodes. I mean this function where we had the mistake. So by using this function, we are dynamically selecting all nodes on the page, ensuring we are always working with the latest set of nodes. This is important because as we add or delete nodes, the elements in the DOM change, so we need an up-to-date list each time we want to enable editing functionality. Now we have to loop through the nodes array using again forage method. So inside here we need nodes dot forage, and then I'm going to add here a callback function with two parameters node and the index number i. So this loop allows us to attach editing functionality to each individual node. For each node, we need to select the title and text elements. 
we will define node title and node text variables inside the loop. So let's create new variable, node title. It should be equal to node dot query selector. And we have to specify here the class name title. Let's duplicate this line of code. And as I said, we need node text. Change the class name. We need node text. So here, node title selects the title element within the current node. And node text selects the node text element within, again, the current node. These variables allow us to target the specific title and content of each node, which is necessary for updating them when the user makes changes. Once we have title and text selected, we will add event listeners to them to handle updates. For this, both variables, we will add an event listener that listens for the blur event. So right after here, I'm going to add node title dot add event listener. And as I said, we're going to use blur event followed by the callback function. So the blur event triggers when the user clicks out of or unfocuses the text area. Inside this event listener, we have to update the title in new nodes or array of node data to reflect any changes the user has made. So I'm going to add here this dot new nodes. Then we need index number i dot title equal to nodes title dot text content. So here we access the specific node in new nodes using the index i, which corresponds to the index of the current node in the loop. By setting title to node title text content, we are updating the title property of the node data with the latest content from the UI. Now, we need the exact similar thing for the node text. Therefore, I'm going to duplicate this code and change title into text. Also, we need here notes and then note text dot text content. All right, so I think the editing functionality is ready. And to apply this code to our application, we have to call edit note method. Like delete note method, we have to call it in two places. The first one is here in the constructor function. We need this dot edit note. And then we have to call it here as well. This dot edit note. Okay, let's go to the browser. I'm going to create new notes. Then if I click here and change the title, also if I click here and change the contents and click outside the notes, the changes will be updated. All right, so everything works fine. We can create, delete, and also edit the notes. And now the next thing that we are going to do is to add a local storage functionality to our application. Before we do that, let's take a moment to understand what local storage is and how it works. So local storage is a web API provided by the browser that allows us to store data directly on the user's device. It is essentially a place where we can save small amounts of data that will persist even after the user refreshes the page or closes the browser. This means that if we store our notes in local storage, users will be able to see their notes again even after they leave the page, I mean close the browser or just refresh the page. Local storage stores data in key value pairs where each piece of data is associated with a unique key. Once it is stored, the data is saved in the browser and remains there until it's explicitly deleted. Also, local storage has a limit of about 5 megabytes per origin, I mean per website, which is more than enough for our app's needs as we are only storing text data for each node. In order to view and manage the local storage, we have to go to developer tools and then find application. So here, as you can see, we have local storage. 
So all the data will be stored here. So let's go ahead and implement local storage functionality. First, we need a way to save data to local storage whenever a change occurs. To do this, we will define a method called setData. We have to add here this dot set data, which should be equal to an arrow function with a parameter data. Then we need to return local storage dot set item. Then we have to pass here node data. And also we need JSON dot stringify. And we have to pass here data. So this method takes data parameter and stores it in local storage under the key node data. To ensure our data is saved in a format that local storage can handle, we use json.stringify method, which converts our array of nodes into a JSON string. This way, our data is ready to be stored as a single string in local storage. Using setData will make it easy to update the stored nodes each time the user adds, edits or deletes the node. Next, we need to retrieve any stored data from local storage when the application starts. Right now, we are storing new nodes in the new nodes array. And to make sure we are always working with the latest data from the local storage, we will replace new nodes with a new property. And it's going to be get data. Then... It should be equal to json dot parse inside here we need local storage dot get item and here we have to pass node data since local storage only stores strings we use json dot parse method to convert this data back into an array of nodes to handle the case where there is no data in local storage yet we will add a fallback so if node data is empty or doesn't exist, get data will default to an empty array. So we need here or operator followed by the empty array. This way we are always starting with a fresh array even if no nodes have been saved yet. With get data now serving as our main data array, we'll need to replace any occurrences of new nodes with get data throughout the code. So I'm going to replace new nodes everywhere with get data we need here get data and also we have to replace new nodes here as well let's search for new nodes so all new nodes are replaced with get data now we need to make sure our data is saved to local storage each time we add edit or delete a node we will do this by calling the set data method in three key places the first one is create node data so here i'm going to insert this dot set data and i'm going to insert here this dot get data Next, we need the same thing in the delete function. I mean here. And also we need to insert it here as well in both cases. So we add the setData method to save the updated data whenever a new node is created, deleted or edited. By adding this line in each of these functions, we ensure that any change the user makes is reflected in local storage, so they will always see their most recent nodes when they return to the application. Now that we have our data saving to local storage, the final step is setting up our local storage functionality to display any saved nodes when the application starts. In order to do this, we have to create a new method. Let's call it create nodes. UI. So this method will be responsible for loading and rendering each node from getData, our main array of nodes. By setting up this function to run whenever the application initializes, we make sure that any node saved in local storage will automatically appear on the screen 
creating a seamless user experience. So to set up the create node UI function, we first need to extract two key variables from the UI controller. So we need here create node HTML and also we need node files. It should be equal to this dot UI controller. As you remember, create node HTML is a function we defined in UI controller where we created this HTML template. As for the node files, it is a container of the nodes. Inside the create node UI function, we will use forish to loop through get data, and for each node, we will call create node HTML function, passing in the node data and the main container where nodes are displayed. So here, I'm going to insert this dot get data followed by the forage method. I'm going to insert here a callback function with nodes data. And then we need create node HTML with two arguments, node data. And also we need node files. So again, inside the function call, we have two arguments, node data and node files. Node data is a single node object that we retrieve from get data array. The second parameter, node files, is the main container element where all nodes are displayed. So with the create node UI set up, we are now ready to load all saved nodes when the application starts by calling this dot create node UI function in the constructor. We ensure that create node UI runs immediately as the application initializes. All right, so let's go to the browser. Create new nodes. Let's add some dummy characters. Now, as you can see, in local storage, we have new node added. Now, if I reload the page, well, the nodes shouldn't be deleted. So we might have some issue in the code. Let's check the newly created method, create node UI. Well, here everything seems to be correct. We have set data in delete function, also in edit function. Let's check create node data. So we have set data here as well. Let's check this code. Well, everything is correct. Also check this line. Well, as you can see, we have here a typo. We need notes, data. Okay, so now I think everything's correct. Actually, let's move this line up. Let's go to the browser and create new notes. Let's create another node. Reload the page. So as you can see, the nodes are still on the screen. I'm going to delete it. Then create another node. Then again, create another node. Delete, reload. So as you can see, everything works perfectly. All right, so that brings us to the end of our notes are projects, we built a fully functional application. If you enjoyed this tutorial, don't forget to give it a like. And if you want to see more projects like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you will be notified when the next video goes live. I'd also love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to drop a comment below, let me know if you ran into any challenges or share what you learned. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.